step integration, mm -hmm. some kind of uh, viable uh, interaction is absolutely essential to have a stable future in the region. Actually, a borderless Middle East is not, in a sense, a new idea to the Middle East. Unity has been tried in this part of the region. Uh, it has been preached by Abdel Nasser before that. We witnessed the, uh, the unity between Egypt and Syria, between Syria and Libya, between uh, Jordan, Iraq. I mean, we, we've right. seen so many variations of yeah. possible unities in this region. And, and the idea of Arab unity ended up with fierce, corrupt dictatorships in most of the places. And now you have a new uh, theory of Arab unity based on Islam, practically preached by Bin Laden, by Zawahiri, uh, by retrieving the Islamic Caliphate in a certain way. So the ideas are not new. Unity is not new. Borderless Middle East is not new. What makes your theory different in results, in outcome, mm -hmm. than what we've tried before? and obviously failed. Mm -hmm. The huge difference is that everything you cited is top-down. And the, the mechanisms of the new Arab unity that I talked about earlier were bottom-up. It's about removing the restrictions for people to integrate, to interact, to invest, to migrate, to learn, to forge those connections, rather than dictating political unity from above for symbolic anti-colonialist kinds of purposes and for uh, short-term diplomatic advantage. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fair description of the episodes of the 50s and 60s and so forth, the posturing. We don't need that anymore. The Arab world doesn't need that anymore. What it does need to do is to allow the bottom-up kinds, the new Arabism as I'm calling it, not the old Arabism, the new Arabism, to allow that to take place. That's what I would like to see much more of. But what are the components of this neo-Arabism uh, if it's not a merely psychological and egocentric reaction to the agility of Turkey, of Iran, and, and, to, to, and it's a response to the, what Prince uh, Saud al-Faisal says uh, or names the strategic emptiness or strategic vacuum of the Arab world. What are the components of this mm -hmm. neo-Arabism if it's not mm -hmm. what I've just said? It's fine if the agility of Turkey and Iran adds some impetus to the need for this Arabism. But it's something that one needs, that the region needs, even if there was not competition mm -hmm. or interference from Iran or from Turkey or from Israel. The region needs it anyway, and it has had it before, as you say. It needs it for economic reasons, needs it for political reasons, it needs it for de demographic reasons. And I think that those bottom-up components that I mentioned, the migration, the labor migration, mm -hmm. the need to lift visa regimes and things like this, the need for economic integration and more investment, uh, and job creation across the region, these are all reasons, real, tangible reasons, not reasons that have to do with how many seats you get at the next conference. Mm -hmm. Those are the real reasons to have the Arab unity. How do you suggest the Arab world, the world in general, would deal with the question of terrorism in a borderless world? Well, terrorism is by definition borderless. So in that sense, it has to deal with it, whether the world has many borders or fewer. And I should point out, again, just to underscore the point, that nothing that I say is to create some kind or to fuel some kind of a conspiracy about breaking up the Arab world. Look at the number of countries that there are in the world today. There's over 200. 60 years ago, there was 100. We're moving in a certain direction, and it's a great paradox of the world today. Yes, more and more countries, more and more fragmentation, but also a lot more globalization, a lot more unity. So you can have adjustments in borders. We always do. We always have for thousands of years, and we always will. Those don't prevent the kind of integration I'm talking about, because if they did, you wouldn't have globalization. You would have 250 autarkic communities. You don't have that, do you? So one doesn't have to hinder the other. Terrorism has, is about resistance, resistance uh, by and large to political oppression, whether it's domestic political oppression or, intern or external 
occupation, and I think that we will always have it. But I think the number one thing that the West in particular can do is to not treat terrorism as if it is identified with any one ideology or any one religion. In fact, I often tell people in the United States to stop using the term Islamic world. Because yes, there is a global community of Muslims. There is a global community of Christians. Do we say the Christian world has a common geopolitical agenda? It doesn't. The Christian countries, especially with, given their enormous internal schism, don't practice the same policies all the time, and neither do Muslim countries. But is this uh, a problem of Western thinking or of uh, the very nature of Islamic identity? I mean, uh, I, do, I don't see, for example, the Christian organization, the international Christian organization, but I see the Islamic uh, conference. I'm saying that the... I mean, the mm -hmm. Muslims identify themselves according to Islam not according to anything else. And this has been an enduring problem on, on the cultural level, on, on the uh, political level, on the economic level. But is terrorism that is carried out by people who are Muslims, is it really religious or is it political? And what I'm telling people it's in both. Washington... Yes, but what it's I'm telling them... It's politicizing Islam in a sense. And how will you solve it? Will you solve it by making religious arguments? Or will you solve it by settling local political grievances? How do you solve because it? Because 99% of terrorism in the world, almost all of the acts of terrorism that you can compile in an annual report mm -hmm. and publish as they do all over, is about local... Well, it's resistance. It's Kashmir. It's Pakistan. It's Afghanistan. It's Iraq. It's Palestine. It's not about Islam. It's not motivated by Islam. And you send the wrong message, or rather the West has received the wrong message, or created the wrong message to explain to itself what is going on mm. by being allowed to use Islam and to even put Islam in this context. This is about politics. And terrorism is 99% of the time about politics. You can mask it. You can cloak it. You can try to legitimize it. But all that does is denigrate the religion. So push it out, keep the religion out of it as much as possible and but, focus on the politics. But I'm sure that you're not hinting at the fact that when uh, Qaeda finishes uh, liberating the Middle East from the United States <laughs> and the Islamic uh, Republic of Iraq uh, finishes, uh, or the Islamic State of Iraq, the uh, Al Qaeda affiliation finishes, uh, the, the, I mean, kicks the Americans out of Iraq and same in Afghanistan and Hezbollah in Lebanon, they will come together and think of a civil uh, United Arab State. I mean, they obviously have a premise an Islamic premise in their, in their thinking. And what makes their... Not only national in this sense. Right. But what makes their narrative any more compelling or any more likely to win? Why are we even talking about it in that sense? Is it really going to happen? Do you see that in the future? When I see Islamist parties across the region, uh, all of which are very legitimate in terms of their political agendas. Mm -hmm. I don't see any need for them to unify or to talk about a caliphate. They don't talk about that. Does the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt talk about the caliphate? They talk about corruption. They talk about resources. They talk about public welfare. They're not talking about uh, recreating a caliphate out of Cairo, or Baghdad, or wherever. They're not talking about seizing that, that ancient history. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to the, uh, uh, the Palestinian question, which is probably the most enduring issue in the Middle East. Uh, when you're talking about the borderless Middle East, and the major issue in the Middle East is the borders of Palestine, the state of Palestine, uh, are you hinting at the death of the two-state solution as the premise for the settlement for this, for this conflict? No. I'm advocating the two-state solution. Mm -hmm. I'm strongly in favor of it. I'm in favor of it happening yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is, again, imminent, but long overdue. I think that the, the plans that have been put forward, uh, the Saudi plan, for example, mm -hmm. and others, speak directly to it. And I don't think that there is a good alternative. I think the alternatives are improvisation, 
and wasting time and causing untold human damage. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should absolutely advocate that because you won't achieve borderlessness and cross-border integration and cooperation mm -hmm. with anyone, whether it's with Israel, but not even in a cons useful way with Jordan in terms of rebuilding that infrastructure, that Hejaz Railway until there is that, that independence and that infrastructure that comes with it. Mm -hmm. I'll take the chance uh, to ask you some questions about world issues, especially about the United States. Um, the past decade witnessed three major blows to, to Washington, to, uh, to the United States. The first of all was 9-11, uh, the second was the economic meltdown, and the third is WikiLeaks. So it sounded like the United States was under attack on three levels. Unable to maintain security, unable to maintain the economic situation it has, and unable to maintain its or, or secure its diplomatic status in the world. The three pillars of any state, right. not to say empire. What does this tell you about America? You know, I think in 10 years or 20 years people will look back maybe and point to these three episodes that you have, uh, that you have, have brought up as, as pretty defining uh, in that sense. And maybe the right answer is to judge the American response and whether or not it has worked. So the response to 9-11, Iraq, Afghanistan, I hardly need to say any more about what that has done in terms of damage to America's geopolitical standing. A. And that's not going to be repaired because the outcome of those conflicts has not been good and no one will forget the mistakes that were made. So that's one. Then there is the financial crisis which originated in America and countries in Asia always remind us today that this was not a global financial crisis but a Western financial crisis. So the economic leadership and standing nowadays when the United States goes and presents its economic strategies to the G20 uh, and other international economic bodies, uh, countries like Germany and others are, are laughing. They're saying this is a clueless policy. We will not follow this. We will not do it this way. So we are in an up for grabs era of economic management. Should there be laissez-faire capitalism? Should there be state capitalism? Clearly, Arab countries, Asian countries, the, all of the emerging markets, Brazil, Russia, and India as well, are experimenting. They're saying we are going to pick and choose from Western models and from state capitalist models, and we are going to decide how to manage our economies. So that's a second blow, in a way, in terms of the second episode that you brought up. And the third, WikiLeaks, I think in a way speaks to a broader trend, which is the the relative decline, the demise of American diplomatic leadership. So not just the strategic and geopolitical, not just the economic, but now the diplomatic. And the realm of ideas, soft power as well. The inability not to suppress or to curtail the freedom of information, but the revelations about how few fresh ideas are coming out of Washington today, whether it comes to resolving territorial disputes here or in other parts of the world or in the economic sphere or cultural leadership. Mm -hmm. There is this, if you add it all up, this overall pattern of the lack of soft power leadership, I think is uh, very uh, revealing as well. So each of your three episodes mm -hmm. that you've pointed to of the last decade is evidence of a weakening uh, United States. Since uh, scenario formulation is part of what you do practically in business, uh, I take the chance to end with a question on Iran. Uh, where do you see the uh, Iranian nuclear crisis going? Are we going to witness a nuclear Iran in the region? Is this something, um, a possibility or a probability? Uh, and uh, how, how do you see the outcome of this crisis affecting the Middle East? Somewhere between a possibility and a probability <laughs> uh, in terms of the technical acquisition of a nuclear weapon. But that's an answer that anyone could give you. 
But I think there's a much more important point, which is that there is a state of mutual hostility and effectively some kind of deterrence that already exists. Whether or not you nuclearize that doesn't change the fact that there is this barrier. So the question that I'm always asking is, how can you isolate that issue and move beyond it? How can you look at the long-term picture in terms of the flow of resources? I mentioned uh, pipelines earlier, for example. God knows Turkey and Europe uh, would like to see the Nabucco pipeline built, for example, in which Iran would be a participant. And yet that's not happening. Trade integration, all of the profits that could be made in Iran for Arab companies, particularly those of, uh, well, here, for across the entire region, really, I want to isolate uh, the nuclear issue and say all of those things you basically have to do eventually. Mm -hmm. You can do it this century or you can do it next century. It's not going to benefit you to wait. And either way, whether or not they have the bomb, you're still going to have deterrence. But I kind of let me um, again uh, remind uh, uh, our... Okay, go ahead, please. Small country, 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 small it's not, well, it's a stylized uh, graphic. It's, so it's, I, it's I, not I, the right yeah. place for this mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely a technical oversight. I'll have a... Oh. <laughs> Obviously, my message is that there is a place for the small states because I'm advocating the creation of a number of new states. So I, I certainly, personally, never forget uh, their importance. And I pointed to Africa earlier in my presentation. Uh, Africa is made up of, of very many small and landlocked states. And what each of them has realized gradually, particularly in East Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, is that they have no choice but to agglomerate, to have transnational infrastructure, much of which they're getting from China, by the way, uh, leveraging Chinese investment, uh, leveraging uh, South African, Nigerian investment as well.